12.2, Self-Presentation. Learning Objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe social roles and how they influence behavior, explain what social norms are and how they influence behavior, define script, and describe the findings of Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment. As you've learned, social psychology is the study of how people affect one another's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. We have discussed situational perspectives and social psychology's emphasis on the ways in which a person's environment, including culture and other social influences, affect behavior. In this section, we examine situational forces that have a strong influence on human behavior, including social roles, social norms, and scripts. We discuss how humans use the social environment as a source of information, or cues, on how to behave. Situational influences on our behavior have important consequences, such as whether we will help a stranger in an emergency, or how we would behave in an unfamiliar environment. Social roles. One major social determinant of human behavior is our social roles. A social role is a pattern of behavior that is expected of a person in a given setting or group. Each one of us has several social roles. You may be, at the same time, a student, a parent, an aspiring teacher, a son or daughter, a spouse, and a lifeguard. How do these social roles influence your behavior? Social roles are defined by culturally shared knowledge. That is, nearly everyone in a given culture knows what behavior is expected of a person in a given role. For example, what is the social role for a student? If you look around a college classroom, you will likely see students engaging in studious behavior, taking notes, listening to the professor, reading the textbook, and sitting quietly at their desk. Of course, you may see students deviating from the expected studious behavior, such as texting on their phones or using Facebook on their laptops. But in all cases, the students that you observe are attending class, a part of the social role of students. Figure 12.8. Being a student is just one of the many social roles you have. Social roles and our related behavior can vary across different settings. How do you behave when you're engaging in the role of son or daughter and attending a family function? Now imagine how you behave when you are engaged in the role of employee at your workplace. It is very likely that your behavior will be different. Perhaps you are more relaxed and outgoing with your family, making jokes and doing silly things. But at your workplace, you might speak more professionally. And although you may be friendly, you are also serious and focused on getting the work completed. These are examples of how our social roles influence and often dictate our behavior to the extent that identity and personality can vary with context, that is, in different social groups. Social norms. As discussed previously, Social roles are defined by a culture's shared knowledge of what is expected behavior of an individual in a specific role. This shared knowledge comes from social norms. A social norm is a group's expectation of what is appropriate and acceptable behavior for its members, how they are supposed to behave and think. How are we expected to act? What are we expected to talk about? What are we expected to wear? In our discussion of social roles, we noted that colleges have social norms for students' behavior in the role of student, and workplaces have social norms for employees' behavior in the role of employee. Social norms are everywhere, including in families, gangs, and on social media outlets. What are some social norms on Facebook? Connect the concepts. Tweens, teens, and social norms. My 11-year-old Je daughter, Jessica, recently told me she needed shorts and shirts for the summer and that she wanted me to take her to a store at the mall that is popular with preteens and teens to buy them. I have noticed that many girls have clothes from that store, so I tried teasing her. I said, 
all the shirts say arrow on the front. If you're wearing a shirt like that and you have a substitute teacher and the other girls are all wearing that type of shirt, won't the substitute teacher think you're all named arrow? My daughter replied in typical 11 year old fashion, mom, you are not funny. Can we please go shopping? I tried a different tactic. I asked Jessica if having clothing from that particular store will make her popular. She replied, no, it will not make me popular. It is what the popular kids wear. It will make me feel happier. How can a label or name brand make someone feel happier? Think back to what you've learned about lifespan development. What is it about preteens and young teens that make them want to fit in? Does this change over time? Think back to your high school experience or look around your college campus. What is the main name brand clothing you see? What messages do we get from the media about how to fit in? Figure 12.9. Young people struggle to become independent at the same time they are desperately trying to fit in with their peers. Script. Because of social roles, people tend to know what behavior is expected of them in specific familiar settings. A script is a person's knowledge about the sequence of events expected in a specific setting. How do you act on the first day of school when you walk into an elevator or at a restaurant? For example, at a restaurant in the United States, if you want the server's attention, we try to make eye contact. In Brazil, you would make the sound Psst, to get the server's attention. You can see the cultural differences in scripts. To an American, saying Psst, to a server might seem rude. Yet to a Brazilian, trying to make eye contact might not seem an effective strategy. Scripts are important sources of information to guide behavior in given situations. Can you imagine being in an unfamiliar situation and not having a script for how to behave? This could be uncomfortable and confusing. How could you find out about social norms in an unfamiliar culture? Zimbardo Stanford Prison Experiment the famous Stanford Prison Experiment, conducted by social psychologist Philip Zimbardo and his colleagues at Stanford University, demonstrated the power of social roles, social norms, and scripts. In the summer of 1971, an advertisement was placed in a California newspaper asking for male volunteers to participate in a study about the psychological effects of prison life. More than 70 men volunteered. And these volunteers then underwent psychological testing to eliminate candidates who had underlying psychiatric issues, medical issues, or a history of crime or drug abuse. The pool of volunteers was whittled down to 24 healthy male college students. Each student was paid $15 per day and was randomly assigned to play the role of either a prisoner or a guard in the study. Based on what you've learned about research methods, why is it important that participants were randomly assigned? A mock prison was constructed in the basement of the psychology building at Stanford. Participants assigned to play the role of prisoners were arrested at their homes by Palo Alto police officers, booked at a police station, and subsequently taken to the mock prison. The experiment was scheduled to run for several weeks. To the surprise of the researchers, both the prisoners and guards assumed their roles with zeal. In fact, on day two, some of the prisoners revolted and the guards quelled the rebellion by threatening the prisoners with nightsticks. In a relatively short time, the guards came to harass the prisoners in an increasingly sadistic manner through a complete lack of privacy, lack of basic comforts, such as mattresses to sleep on, and through degrading chores and late night counts. The prisoners, in turn, began to show signs of severe anxiety and hopelessness. They began tolerating the guards' abuse. Even the Stanford professor who designed the study and was the head researcher, Philip Zimbardo, found himself acting as if the prison was real and his role as prison supervisor was real as well. After only six days, 
the experiment had to be ended due to the participants' deteriorating behavior. Zimbardo explained, quote, At this point, it became clear that we had to end the study. We had created an overwhelmingly powerful situation, a situation in which prisoners were withdrawing and behaving in pathological ways, in which some of the guards were behaving sadistically. Even the good guards felt helpless to intervene, and none of the guards quit while the study was in progress. Indeed, it should be noted that no guard ever came late for his shift, called in sick, left early, or demanded extra pay for overtime work. End quote. The Stanford Prison Experiment demonstrated the power of social roles, norms, and scripts in affecting human behavior. The guards and prisoners enacted their social roles by engaging in behaviors appropriate to the roles. The guards gave orders, and the prisoners followed orders. Social norms require guards to be authoritarian and prisoners to be submissive. When prisoners rebelled, they violated these social norms, which led to upheaval. The specific acts engaged by the guards and the prisoners derived from scripts. For example, guards degraded the prisoners by forcing them to do push-ups and by, rem by removing all privacy. Prisoners rebelled by throwing pillows and trashing their cells. Some prisoners became so immersed in their roles that they exhibited symptoms of mental breakdown. However, according to Zimbardo, none of the participants suffered long-term harm. The Stanford Prison Experiment has some parallels with the abuse of prisoners of war by U.S. Army troops and CIA personnel at the Abu Ghraib prison in 2003 and 2004. The offenses at Abu Ghraib were documented by photographs of the abuse, some taken by the abusers themselves. Figure 1210, Iraqi prisoners of war were abused by their American captors in Abu Ghraib prison during the Second Iraq War. Figure 